to our winter communion and a morning of fellowship together. On behalf of the congregation, I welcome all visitors. And in particular, I welcome June McKinnon's daughter here from Washington, DC, here for June's 90th birthday. So congratulations, June, on your birthday. <laughs> and as well, the Campbell family this week have welcomed a new member of the family and we congratulate David and Carolyn on the safe arrival of a grandson. Thank you. On this Trinity Sunday, we join with millions of Christians around the world to worship God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy God, we gather as your children. Holy, holy, holy Christ, we sit at your feet. Holy, holy, holy Spirit, we come to worship. As part of our worship today, we will be meeting together around the Lord's table. Sovereign God, all loving, all gracious, all powerful, you deserve our praise. Mighty God, ever faithful, ever near, ever active, you deserve our worship. Eternal God, for all your goodness, mercy, and truth, you deserve our thanks. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Amen.
God, you are greater than our minds can grasp, yet you have revealed your glory to us. You are before all, above all, beyond all, yet you lived and died among us. You are at work in every situation and circumstance, yet so often we fail to recognize your presence. For our narrowness of vision, our feebleness of faith, our spiritual blindness, forgive us. Oh God, you are there watching over us day by day. You are here by our sides until the end of the age. You are here within now and always. For our rejection of your care, our forgetfulness of your presence, and our stifling of your movement, forgive us. Accept now our worship for all its weakness, our discipleship for all its frailty, our service for all its limitations. Speak to us this day so that we may experience more of your love. Reflect more of your goodness and live with more of your power. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. And to you, the one God, be glory, praise, and honor today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. The love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the blessings of the Holy Spirit are ours without price or condition. Rejoice in the good news that you are forgiven. Boys and girls, if you make your way out to the front. I'll see you in the usual place. Well, good to have you all here. Now, I'm sure you won't be able to answer this question, although there is a clue in the order of service, but you mightn't have a copy, so you mightn't be able to see that clue. What special day is this? What is the name? I know it's Sunday, but it's a special Sunday. What is it called? Nobody knows. Does anybody know? Trinity, yes, yeah, I'm going to say. Well, today is known as Trinity Sunday. And uh, it's the, well, I'm not doing it today, but most ministers take the day off. And the reason why is because they don't want to talk about the Trinity. Not, well, not so much because they don't want to talk about it. They don't understand it. And if they try to explain it to anybody, well, they won't understand it either. Well, I'm not on holiday, I'm here, and I'm not too sure that I can explain the Trinity either. Trinity, it's all about one figure, three, tri, tri unity. It's about three particular things or 
more likely in this case, three particular people. Well, I brought something with me this morning, and I'm not sure it's going to help us very much, but we'll at least try. If I could get the right one out, it would help. What's that? And what's a fork used for? For eating. Which hand do you hold the fork in? Which one? The left one. Would somebody like to hold up this fork? There we are. Hold it up. Come stand up beside me here. Now, got something else. What's this? A knife? It's not too sharp, thankfully. It's just not too dangerous. What's a knife used for? Well, yes. What else is a knife used for? Yes, it is used for cutting, but yes? Somebody mentioned earlier, yes? Somebody mentioned earlier about eating. Who said that? Right. Well, do you think that you need to use a knife to eat as well? What kind of a house do you live in? What's that? Well, by the way, when you're eating with a knife, what are you trying? Cutting is right. That is true. What are you cutting? What about meat, for example? Can you eat a big piece of meat without actually cutting it? I don't think so. So you use a knife to do that. Now I've got one final thing to show you. Can anybody guess what it is? What's this? And what is a spoon used for? Eating. Give me an example of something you eat with a spoon. Yes? Rice. Oh, yes, that's one good example, yes. And there's lots of things that we um, have as desserts and we use a spoon to eat them. Now, where's the knife? Uh, sorry, where's the fork? Who's holding the fork? All right, stand up beside me here. Who's holding the knife? Who's got the knife? All right, stand up. Show, show the knife to everybody. Who wants to hold it there, Sophie? You hold the spoon up. All right, there we are. Now, what's the, what's the difference between the fork and the knife and the spoon? Are they the same? But they serve the same purpose. They help us to eat. Yeah, but I'm confused here. If you've got a knife, and a fork and a spoon, and they're all used for eating, they're all supposed to be different, and yet they do the same thing. Oh dear, oh, I, I don't understand this at all. Actually, let me be honest about this. I'm trying to tell you what the Trinity is like. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons. Now, we might say they all do different things. God loves us. He sends His Son, Jesus, into this world to show His love for us. And after He has gone back to heaven, as we were reminded last Sunday, God sends His Holy Spirit. Remember Pentecost? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you see, Although they have different functions, like the knife and the fork and the spoon, they are all one. You can't make a knife and a fork and a spoon into one instrument. They sit at the table, the fork is on the left, the knife is on the right, and the spoon is in between. 
Well, I don't know. I haven't been very successful in trying to explain the Trinity to you. But at least it's an attempt. So the next time you sit down to eat your dinner, which probably will be today, when you use a knife and a fork and a spoon, knife and a fork to eat your main course, and a spoon to eat your dessert, try and think of this as an illustration of the Trinity as we try to come to some understanding of who it is that we worship today, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They have different functions, like the knife and the fork and the spoon, but unlike those utensils, they are all one. Let's do our best to understand that as we worship God today. Well, now, normally we sing a hymn at the end of your talk. We're not doing that today. We'll now invite you to leave church and go with your teachers to have your program in the hall. Thank you. I'll take my spoon and my knife and my fork back. (laughs) Where's my spoon? It's gone. Ah, oh, knife, sorry. (laughs) Thank you. Old Testament lesson is Psalm 9. Oh, I beg your pardon, Psalm 8. Hear the word of God. Our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Today's New Testament lesson comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Hear the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning's announcements are in the bulletin, but I draw to your attention the men's breakfast next Saturday morning with guest speaker Leon Harbour, who is the chaplain to the Parliamentary Christian Fellowship. All men are invited to attend. Also, the drop-in centre at Western Creek will have their um, musical morning on Tuesday, this Tuesday, the fall the second and fourth, yes, this Tuesday at the Western Creek Worship Centre. And this morning, as we serve the elements, you will find your bread in a little tea bag. I, I know they're a little bit awkward to take off the plate, but um, it's the only way we can serve the bread without the bread being exposed to everyone picking up a piece. I now invite Beck to tell us about Holiday Club. Thank you. So good morning everyone. We wanted to share some exciting stories about our upcoming holiday club in the July school holidays. We opened our registrations only last weekend and we have had over 20 kids already registered. In fact, we've even had families asking us since January, when will our registrations open? Because their kids didn't want to miss out on a spot. It's amazing and exciting that all of our kids registered are not even from our church or from our parish. So we have an opportunity as a church to reach out and share Jesus with families who have come before, but we even have new families who have never been to Holiday Club. One of our families has had their kids attending across the past 15 years. They have a wide age gap. But they sent us an email to say thank you for our wonderful program. All of their kids have enjoyed it and have been blessed by our teaching and our activities. We also know that we have families who have no church connection, who have already registered. In fact, our first family registered this year, found our link before we'd even officially opened it. So that's pretty exciting too. But we need everyone. We need youth, adults, grandparents. We need more volunteers so that we can keep our registrations open for more children to attend. So we want to give a special call out to our grandparents this morning. We know that you love spending time with your grandkids, playing games, doing art, and just doing activities with them. Imagine if you could come to Holiday Club this year and be someone else's grandparent for a day or for even the whole week. How exciting would that be for a child and for you as well. 
So registration is open for kids from preschool to year six. It would actually be a shame if some of our, our, our church families here missed out. So I encourage you to book quickly so you're not to be disappointed. I can't wait to chat with all of you in the hall after about kid regos, about joining our leadership team, about being a grandparent for the week, all volunteers. Thank you. It's Trinity Sunday, a day that goes unmentioned and unrecognized in many churches each year. Some preachers find the very thought of preaching a sermon on the Trinity too daunting on the one hand and too boring on the other. While the subject of the Trinity is certainly daunting, it is anything but boring. We acknowledge that we can never fully exhaust all there is to say about the Trinity. None of the metaphors or images that we customarily use, such as the knife and fork and spoon that we use to illustrate the Trinity, fully capture who the Trinitarian God is. The difficult part of Trinity Sunday is realizing that any explanation of the majesty and mystery of the Trinity ought not look like providing a mathematical discourse on the nature of God. The Trinity, to put it simply, is not about maths. Recently I read a story about a lady who was a mature church member. She mentored a 12-year-old female student who was exceptionally intelligent. 
the lady was preparing the student for confirmation. During the preparation course, the student was assigned the task of writing out her statement of faith. For the most part, the task was a breeze. The student wrote an impressive faith statement that read as if she had decades of experience of being a Christian, not a mere twelve years. As the mentor was reviewing the statement, the student piped up confessing, you might have noticed there's nothing in it about the Trinity. Well, now that you mention it, you're right, said the mentor, recognizing the uncharacteristically quizzical look on the student's face. You know, I believe in it and all, said the student sheepishly. But if I have to think about it any more, my head will explode. The mentor paused and realized the enormity of asking a twelve-year-old to dole out some theological formulation concerning the Trinity. The mature mentor and intelligent student talked together about the head-pounding task of trying to articulate the nature of the triune God, summing up their conversation with this, the Trinity is not about mouths. Colin Gunton wrote, overall, there is a suspicion that the Trinity is a bore, a matter of mathematical conundrums and illogical attempts to square the circle. The Gospel of Matthew offers us the only instance of the traditional Trinitarian formula in all of Scripture. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Famous words of Jesus when He said to His disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. These words of Jesus do not include a mouth's lesson. The emphasis of this statement known as the Great Commission, is not theological formulation, but missional expansion. This involves disciple-making, baptizing, and teaching. All of these are component parts of the first word Jesus spoke in this command. Look at it. You have it in front of you. Go, says Jesus. Get on the move. Head out to the hinterlands. Strap your sandals. Go. Maybe instead of getting caught up in trying to explain the maths of the Trinity, we should rename this Sunday Great Commission Sunday. Last week was Pentecost when the Holy Spirit arrived with a whoosh and with fire and gave birth to the church. It makes sense that a week later, the church should get its marching orders. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This Trinitarian formula that Jesus gives is set in a context. Matthew gives us an important piece of information which we easily overlook. I have to confess that it wasn't until a few days ago as I was preparing this sermon that I realized, even though I've read this passage countless times, 
I had never noticed this piece of information. Let me just read verses 16 and 17 to you. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when he saw them, they worshipped him. But there's an added phrase. But some doubted. They worshipped him. But some doubted. That little phrase but some doubted, I had missed it. I suspect you may have as well. But some doubted. Does that ring a bell? Remember Thomas post-resurrection? Did he still doubt? Some of the disciples doubted, or maybe all of them doubted to some extent. Either way, worship and doubt are inextricably linked here. Some of the disciples weren't sure if they could trust the very one they were worshiping. But they worshiped in spite of their doubt. Why do you think Matthew added the phrase, but some doubted? Maybe Matthew is reminding us that doubt is an integral part of our faith. Someone once said that the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's certainty. When we are certain of something, we don't need faith. Even the closest followers of Jesus who had been with Him for three years had their moments when they, they just weren't sure. They had recently witnessed one of the most glorious acts of God in human history. They are honest enough to record their struggle to believe and comprehend it all. Yet believe they did a belief that leads them to begin a movement that would transform the world, indeed turn the world upside down. But some doubt it. I'm glad Matthew included this phrase. It reminds us that our triune God is comfortable with our questions and struggles. It encourages us to bring them to God and provides us with a way of dealing with them. If you are telling me that you never have any doubts about your faith, then with the greatest of respect, I would suggest that you are a dishonest Christian. We all have them from time to time. But here's the point. We deal with our doubt by seeking Jesus, by coming and engaging in worship, such as we are doing this morning. We deal with our doubt when we approach Jesus, and then our doubt dissipates 
not by any teaching or action, simply by His presence amongst us. Jesus' presence assures His disciples in all their struggles that even though they do not understand, they can still trust Him. I hope that that is an encouragement to you. If you have doubts in your life, you question your faith from time to time, but here in church this morning, you come into this place with all your doubt, and yet you engage in worshiping Him. Jesus then commissions the eleven disciples to get back out there and keep this thing going. However, we must remember that Jesus does not place the entire onus on the disciples to accomplish this task. Before uttering the Great Commission, Jesus reminds the disciples that authority in heaven and on earth is His. Verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's not take what Jesus says as some commission that places responsibility entirely on our shoulders. Jesus tells us, hey, the keys to the kingdom of God are still in my hands, but I've chosen you, disciples, to be part of this enterprise to be agents in the kingdom of God. William Willimon points out, it is God who makes the move toward us. Think about the scenes that set up Jesus' meeting with the eleven disciples. It is Jesus who gets out of the grave on resurrection day. It is Jesus who meets the two Marys and tells them to relay the rendezvous point to the disciples. It is Jesus who comes to the disciples. And when He sees them, even with their doubt, He gives them this great commission to go into all the world and proclaim the good news of the gospel. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the triune God whom we worship, whom we fully know in Jesus Christ. It is at the commissioning of this God that we go out. It is at the, this commissioning that we go out into the world. Not because we can drum up some cause for evangelism or disciple-making or teaching by our own power. It is only because God in Christ comes to us and then sends us out. He is the one who gets us moving, and He promises to be with us always. Well, just before I finish, I want to quickly change tack for just a moment and draw out a few observations on the Trinitarian formula in Matthew 28, verse 19. Let me just read it again. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is the basis for a particular type of community. It is the one that Jesus inaugurates through assigning the Great Commission to His 
11 disciples. Remember, Judas had long departed the scene. The relationship that exists within God's own self is a model for the type of relationships that are meant to exist in the church. What we find within the Trinity is perfect harmony and mutuality. The different members of the Trinity are never at cross purposes with each other. We have an example of this at the moment of Jesus' baptism when the Holy Spirit descends and the words of blessing are heard from the Father. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. He said, Go. He said, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Last week we celebrated Pentecost, remembering the day when the specific work of the Holy Spirit to breathe life into the church where people of all languages might find themselves united as children of God through faith in Christ. What diversity there was in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, but what unity there was amongst all those Christian believers from various parts of the earth. Is there that sense of unity? amongst us? The Trinity as a model for Christian community also reveals that love need not be binary or finite, and that in fact God invites us into loving in a way that always makes room for the other. This indeed is an extraordinary kind of love for which God alone can equip us. William Platcher captures the idea well when he writes, Nothing is rarer or more magnificent than to wish that another be loved equally by the one whom you love supremely and by whom you are supremely loved. Reflecting on what we learn about the character of God through the doctrine of the Trinity and what it has to teach us about our own communities leads us to ask, where does our current witness, whether as a local congregation here at St. Andrews in Canberra or the global church, show evidence that we have embraced the kind of community we see reflected in God's own self. Well, I think we have to confess that there is so much more work for us to do. It saddens me greatly to see the church so divided on many issues. Just imagine the impact we would have on the world if the church was one. What a transformation that would bring to our world. I believe it is incumbent upon us to strive for unity within the Christian church. On this Trinity Sunday, as we reflect on the Trinity, we are led finally to the communion table spread before us. And at this table, we experience the wide-open love present within God's own self extended outward. An invitation to come and feast as members of a particular community where all are welcome. Let me repeat that. All are welcome. It's quite a compelling embodiment of that love. After we have feasted at this table, 
Let us then go from this place of worship, even with our doubt, to proclaim the good news of the gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As we have observed, the Trinity is not about mouths. Amen. Creator God, accept these gifts as humble thanks for your great gift of life. Ever-present Christ, accept these gifts to serve your mission and share your good news throughout the world. Spirit of life, accept these gifts and shape our lives in loving them. Amen. God, Creator, Redeemer, and Comforter, we pray for the safety and preservation of the earth, of nations, for justice and reconciliation in this great land of Australia, for integrity and wisdom in all who govern us. We pray for your church for those who are your disciples in every nation, for all who are newly baptized or confirmed, for those appointed to lead your church, for all who worship in this place. We pray for all in need, for all who grieve the loss of those they loved we remember Helen Wilson and her family at this time who grieve the loss of a loved one. For all who feel sad or lonely or unwanted, for those in pain of body or anguish of mind, for all who give comfort, care, hope, or relief. We pray for those in our congregation who are ill or are recovering from recent surgery. Stella Lees, Audrey Schultz, John Wickett, Colin Cartwright, Bob Howe, Gordon Patterson, Beth Wilson and Carolyn Campbell. Lay your healing touch upon each one. 
We give thanks for all who have died in the faith, for those whose anniversary occurs at this time of year, for those whom we have loved who are now at rest with you. Teach us to follow you in obedience and trust that we may come with all your saints to dwell with you in your community of love. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We join together in praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the Son, and I trust and hope most fully in that manhood crucified, and each thought and deed unruly do to death as he has died. Simply to his cry life and strength belong, and I love supremely solely, him the holy, him the strong. And I hold in veneration for the This is the table of the Lord. He invites all who love Him from whatever branch of the Christian church they are part of to sit with Him and share in this joyful communion feast. What a privilege it is to meet around the Lord's table on this Trinity Sunday particularly as we have thought about that unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May that model be an example for us to follow, not only as we share in this service this morning, but as we continue to live our lives and witness for Christ in the community in the days ahead. Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper according to St. Paul. The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord Himself, that on the night of His arrest the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. 
do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The elements of the bread and wine will now be uncovered. As the Lord Jesus took bread, I take this bread and wine to be set apart for this holy use. And as he gave thanks, let us give our thanks and praise. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks. Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, for the majesty of your glory, the wonder of your works, and the riches of your grace. Send down your Holy Spirit to bless us, and these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be for us the communion of the body of Christ and the cup of blessing which we bless, the communion of the blood of Christ, that we, receiving them by faith, may be made partakers of his body and blood with all his benefits to nourish us and help us grow in grace to the glory of your most holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who find refuge in Him.
the body of Christ broken for you. the blood of Christ shed for you.
The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and hope and love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always.